Welcome to the adventures of a serial entrepreneur. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, there's obviously two of us, two serial entrepreneurs, but uh, we've, uh, we've created the series to share with you stories from our entrepreneurial career, so you can uh, learn a few things here and there. In the last, uh, or in the first episode, um, this is the second episode, in the first episode we covered uh, the very beginnings of both of our inter entrepreneurial careers, uh, and this time, uh, this episode is called The Island, and you'll soon find out why. So, uh, we're going to start with uh, Rick continuing his story uh, from basically when he started working in the island. And he's going to tell us all about the things that he learned and how he grew his business at that point uh, until he made his first business sale. Um, so, over to you. Well, the island that Tyler is talking about is called Cockatoo Island, which is the name of the island, but it was also known as Cockatoo Dockyard. But just before, and I know that I mentioned that in the first episode, but before I jump to the island, there's probably a few things that I should uh, talk about before I get to, you know, the detail as to what went on in that place. I, I actually worked there for four years. But a couple of things I left out of the last episode when we first introduced how we got this entrepreneurial journey rolling. Yeah. And I'd just like to go back to uh, as soon as I finished high school. As soon as I finished high school in year 12, I got my very first job basically the week after the, the higher school certificate had concluded. And it was a pretty ordinary job making pallets of all things. And as it turned out, uh, I didn't know I had an allergy to the sort of dust that was coming from the manufacturing of these pallets. But the way I had been brought up was to work really hard, like super, super hard. You know, I, I watched my dad, as I said in the last episode, pull 100 hour weeks and never got crook and so forth. And and, you know, I was, I was running all these things while I was at school and, and uh, here I am, I've now just left school, got my first job, went out there and I worked the way that I thought you were supposed to work, which was work really hard. I went out there and, you know, it, it was a big area. There was like uh, probably 40 different people that worked there. And I would basically, you know, I was jogging from point A to point B. And, you know, with a nail gun and you're putting the, the timber into the beams, you know, tung, 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 tung. and I, I did that. So, at a, so you mean jogging as in you're in a hurry? I was in a you're, hurry you're to get running, the job done. Running I, around the place. I figured that's the way you do things. I always, yeah. you know, I always saw that if you're being paid to do a job, you, you did the job, sure. you know, in such a way that it would be done to the best of your ability and you do it fairly quickly. And I didn't even, you know, I was in a state of oblivion. I didn't even realize that I was going at two, three, four, five times faster than everybody else. Anyway, I just did what I thought was right for that first day. I then uh, went home that night and I had a pretty blocked nose and all that sort of stuff as you do when you've got an allergy. And I went to work the next day and I, my modus operandi, my choice of how I, I chose to conduct myself in the workplace, the, the choice, the hat that I wore to to impress those that employed me and uh, not knowing that I wasn't necessarily impressing all the people around me that were co-workers who were looking at me saying probably to themselves, who's this guy? This is not looking good for us that we're taking their time or coasting. Went home the second day and, and this time when I woke up on the beginning of the third day, I felt like crap. You know, I felt really, really crook. And I, and I knew that there was a problem, and uh, I did have a problem with my nose. I had surgery a, a couple of years before that for an allergy situation, and uh, the boss said to me, mate, you, you've got to come back. We need you here. You know, you, 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 you've changed the culture of the workplace here in, in, in the two days that you've been here. And I didn't quite understand what he was talking about. Anyway, to cut a long story short, he offered uh, double my wage. So in my first job, within two days, my wage doubled. See, see it also goes to show you how um, 
differently an employer looks at someone who works hard. I mean, a lot of the time people think at, uh, think of employers or the boss as being this horrible creature that wants to suck the life out of everyone, but in fact, uh, employers are just human beings that want to make ends meet and they are looking very hard for someone who will do the job well, fast, efficiently, and so on. And, and obviously in that case, they just grabbed onto that situation and they could see that there's a big difference in the work ethic. And they obviously wanted to continue with that. Well, the thing that he said on the phone to me was when I spoke to him and I could hardly breathe, my nose was completely blocked. And uh, he said, you've had uh, such a profound impact on this place. You've sped up every other, you've done something that right. we weren't able to do by virtue of making everyone else go faster. There's culture for you straight away, isn't it? And I was an 18 year old kid, you know, I just left high school. So uh, that really right. showed me again that was, the, that was probably the first, you know, I talked about Dr. Ashley and what he had to say about, you know, mm. if you want to look at these guys, they're going to get top marks in the, in the mid-semester exams, blah, blah, blah. We, we went on about that last time. But then what happened after this, and I couldn't go back, I was just too crook. I then moved out of home at 18 mm. into my own apartment with my, uh, my high school girlfriend, sweetheart at the time. Mm -hmm. So we, we had a household in the big smoke that we called it, which you know, moved from like a country town, which was, you know, an hour and a half from the city. We moved down to this little waterfront apartment, which was just coincidence that it was on the water. And um, I got a, uh, uh, I was doing um, bridging courses to get to get me started in university. So here I was now doing university part time and I went and got a job, another full-time job, working in a factory. Yeah. I was 18, driving uh, 45 minutes to work every day, coming back, doing university at night time. We, we went through that last time in the story. And within the period of the five months that I was working there, I was basically promoted to foreman at, you know, just about to turn 19. And well, sorry, which job was that? This was manufacturing wheels. Okay, right. Uh, these were three piece wheels for racing cars and people that had a fair bit of coin that they wanted to put fancy wheels yeah. on their cars. They weren't just ordinary mag wheels. And they were all handmade, that's the thing. And so I was the only one that the owner of the business taught how to use every piece of equipment on the factory floor. I'm talking mm -hmm. from spinning wheels to to tool making, to fitting, to painting, to shaping, to you name it. Mm. And um, again, I got promoted very quickly. I worked the way that I thought you were supposed to work. You wanted to get to, to learn as much as possible. And, you know, I was doing any part time. It was pretty taxing. I made the decision then after being there for five or six months to, to leave that and then go to university full time. And I did that for the next five uh, months or so. Mm -hmm. I then got another job at the end of that semester. So that's the end of year one of university. I then went and got another job for a few months on a factory floor. And uh, then I went back to university full time for the very next semester. That was like a fill in. And I took on too much study. Mm. I took on, would you believe, eight subjects in engineering. And these are heavy duty subjects. They're three hours a piece, 24 hours face to face. And they said that basically every three hours that you did face to face teaching and engineering at that time for the way that we did it, there was three hours of your own time you'd have to invest to, to match for every one hour there. So essentially 24 times four, that's a 96 hour work week. Mm. And I failed a subject which I couldn't believe. I, I couldn't fathom that I failed this subject. I really thought I did well. And so what I insisted was having, the, having it remarked. Mm. I didn't have it remarked once or twice. I had it remarked three times. Mm. And on the third time, I insisted to go to the office to inspect the remark myself. Mm. And I was lucky that when I walked into the remarking office, that the lecturer who actually marked my examination paper, who had really bad handwriting, was walking in to the room at that very point in time when I was holding it in my hand, and I couldn't believe I looked up to him and I said, excuse me, can I just ask you, what is that number there? And he looked at it and he said, well, that's a five. 
Now, this was a, a score three out of five or five out of five. Mm. And it was marked, I got 48 out of 50. And it turned out I got five out of five, which bumped me up to 50, which meant I passed. Mm. Now, it's unheard of that you would force for something to be remarked three times. It's unheard of that you would go there to inspect the remarking to make sure, you know, I was... I didn't think that was even possible. I was so persistent yeah. in the belief that I had not failed. Right. And as it turns out, I passed. And as a result of passing, uh, that meant that all eight subjects I passed because on another one, mm. I only just scraped through by 49%, which means that because I failed the other one, I failed two. Right. But now because I passed that one, they gave me what's called a conceded pass, which meant I passed all eight. And um, that was a huge relief off my shoulders. And what happened just after that was I made a decision to go after what was called a cadetship. I, I, had, I made a decision to go and get a job and uh, be quite creative in the way in which I would try and get employment. Yeah. Because with the degree that we were doing back then, you, had to, you couldn't graduate without three years of full-time certified employment that complemented the stuff that we were doing at university. And so I wrote out all these letters and sent them off to places that weren't even advertising for positions. Mm. And sure enough, I got called up by a couple of them, and one of them was Cockatoo Island, Cockatoo Dockyard. And they called me down. They weren't advertising, looking for anyone. And they interviewed me. And remember this, in the last episode, I talked about having got up and speaking in front of the audience and so forth and realized that there was something there that I could leverage, which was my ability to sell myself and communicate and so forth. I uh, had this uh, interview with three of the big people that worked on the island. There was 2,300 people that worked there. And... They said, you know, um, this is very interesting that you would just write us a letter like this out of the blue. Cut a long story short, they said, you know, this is a, you, you're quite enterprising. We'd like to talk to you about not just a job, but a cadetship. Mm. Now, cadetships were hard to come by. Basically, you're being paid to go to work, to learn what you need to learn, and you're being paid to also go to university. So this was a huge deal, way beyond any of my expectations. Anyway, so cut a long story short, I got I got uh, got the job, this job that didn't exist. We created this position, mm. and they put me in an office. And then this was in 1982, and not long after that, they put me into what was called the apprentice training school. Mm. Now, at this point in time, I'm entering into third year of university. So I'm doing really high level mathematics and so forth, you know, ordinary differential equations, multiple integrals, calculus, you name it. And they put me in there with these 15 and 16 year old kids. Mm. Now bear in mind, I'd already worked on factory floors. I'd been doing tool making, fitting and turning. I did metal work in high school. I, I knew how to operate all the machines and so forth. And that's where my trouble started, at this place. And I was in there working with uh, these kids in the apprentice training school, I had to be there for weeks, like two months. Week one was sitting there teaching us fractions. Great. Fractions. You kind of right? knew a little bit about that already. And here I am, I bear in mind, my first business was Chisholm's Coaching College, yeah. and that taught mathematics up to first year university level. So <laughs> we're teaching stuff like calculus and pretty heavy duty stuff. And the, I'm there in the class, sitting there, and they'd say, you know, what's seven eighths plus three quarters, whatever the case may be. And I obviously would prattle off the answer. And I remember he said, uh, Mr. Chisholm, uh, you don't need to answer all these questions. And I thought, well, what am I doing here? Why is he asking the question? You know, anyway, cut a long story short. He said, I'd like to talk to you outside the room. Troublemaker. I was a troublemaker. <laughs> this is where the trouble really started, right? Yeah. And this got really out of hand. This is just the beginning. Mm. And he said, what do you think you're doing? I said, I said, I said to the guy, I said, you know, you know I'm, I'm not 15 or 16 and I'm in the third year, third year university, right? And this is this whole thing where they're trying to put you under the thumb, right? The whole blue collar, white collar thing. And I was the only guy that was out of 2,300 people that was going to university. And so we had this conflict from the beginning 
when I started to work with all the blue collar guys. And, and, and I've got no problem with that. I had a problem with what they were trying to do though, which was dumb me down. And so anyway, that went on for a little bit. And then we went on the tools. Yeah. Now you've got a couple of months to go through all these projects, you know, making all these different things. And uh, cut a long story short, I made them all within the first five days. Mm. I didn't take two months. And then it, it came to a head where he thought, you know, they thought I was just being a bit of a smart ass and they came up to me with this big block of solid metal and they put it in my hand and I said, here's this block of metal and uh, you're gonna get a hammer and a chisel and you're gonna chisel this block of metal into this shape. And I, that's when I blew it and I said, uh, no, I'm not gonna do that. And they said, uh, yes, you are. And I said, uh, Mr. Chisholm, that's exactly what we're gonna. I said, no, I'm not gonna do it. Um, and I'd like to talk to someone about that because we both know that that's never gonna be a practical application of anything that I'm ever gonna do, let alone anyone else is ever gonna do. You don't get a chisel and a hammer and chisel a piece of metal into shape for something that's going to be relevant to what it was as to why I was there. Mm. So let me let me stop here uh, or pause here. There, there's again a common denominator here to what I'm seeing with the stories and the behaviors as we go through. There's the um, not conforming with the way things are and you know we, we all raise our kids to do what they're told and to do what they're supposed to do and to always listen and you know listen to the boss and do what they're, what they're supposed to do. But in fact, in this case, that would have taken you backwards. Um, Very much so. And, and, you know, and even the novel approach of going out there and knocking on doors and looking for jobs that didn't even exist in the past. Uh, all of that, I see that as just you trying to break out of the mold and pushing out of, you know, where you've been boxed in or where you're mm -hmm. supposed to be boxed in. So that's certainly something that is an, a recurring theme in the stories. Um, and also the fact that you're just not sitting there and taking it. You're, you're literally being a troublemaker and <laughs> causing, causing all sorts of pain and suffering for those around Well, <laughs> as a result of me refusing to, you know, knock this block of metal into the shape that they wanted me to, blah, 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 I got taken down to head office and this became a thing. Cut a long story short, I've got the... Uh, the personal development manpower manager there. I've got the apprentice training manager. I've got the, the guy that ran the workshop. They're all there and I'm there in my light blue overalls and they're there in their suits. And it, it, it the question was, you know, Mr. Chisholm, what do you want? What do you really want? And I said, well, I want to know where I want to know the names of every departmental head of every department. I want to know where every nut and bolt and washer is. I want to know how every department works. So now you're setting the rules too. <laughs> Maybe. Not only not Maybe. conforming. It turned out that I writing. did, but I'll, I'll sort of show you how I got there. Yeah. And I said, um, and, I, and I said to these three elders, if you will, I would have thought that you would want me to be the best that I can be. Mm. I would have thought this is what you would want as a responsible employer, so that in order that I can give you the best service as to why you're paying me to be here. And you can hear a pin drop. So here's this 19 year old, 20 year old kid making, you know, it's actually I was 20 then, I was making all this sense. And they're trying to do this and it's backfiring. And there's three of them, right? And anyway, I said, I wanna work with a different tradesperson every day of the week, and I want to be in a different department. I want to, you know, I want to work in every department on the island, from sheet metal to fitter welders, to maintenance, um, to, to, to uh, fitting turning, didn't matter what it was. And so <laughs> the, I, I got my way, and the very first thing that they put me on uh, was working on the submarines. Mm over on class submarines. And I report for duty that day and the leading hand, they wore the dark green overalls. It was all, you know, um, what's that? Color coded or? Well, not color, yeah, color coded, yes, but it was, it was, you know, it was I, all I, these I, levels. Yeah. And he said, oh, you know, I turned up, he said, and then this guy's like this tall, he's looking up at me and he says, 
uh, you're the guy from going to university, are you? I said, uh, well, yeah, I do. And, um, uh, and I'm here to, to work with someone today. And he handed me this little tiny scraper, like this big. And he said, this is a scraper. You know what that is? And I said, yeah, I think it's a scraper. And he said, you see the back up there, the back of the submarine? The submarine is out of the water. It's on a dock. He said, you're going to get up there under the torpedo tube. And he said, you're going to scrape the paint off the inside of the torpedo tube. Mm. It's like freezing cold in the metal torpedo tube, which is like this diameter, just as well. I wasn't claustrophobic. And I went up there, and so I'm scraping away, and I'm getting really good at scraping paint off the inside of the torpedo tube, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what I did. And the next day, I came in to report for work, because remember the deal was I would work with somebody different and do something different every day. Mm. I went back and I said, I'm back. Uh, thanks very much for letting me uh, be exposed to that. I've learned how to scrape paint really well. There's the scraper. He said, oh, no, you get back up there and you, you're going to be scraping all of them. And I said, uh, no, that wasn't the arrangement that I had with the manpower development manager and the management team. I said, you do what I tell you to do. And here we go again. And I'm in trouble again. Sent down to the office. I get six of the best again. And it's on and there I'm sitting there and they're all lined up there, you know, in their suits. And uh, anyway... I, I didn't end up going back up there. I got my way again. I ended up working with a different person every day. And you can imagine how much I learned mm. and the respect that I earned from working with all of the different uh, tradespeople. Um, and it worked out fantastic in the end, to cut a long story short. And it's a very long story because that went on for 12 months of working with you know what would have been 100 or 200 different people across mm. a dozen different departments. Anyway, um, I guess the story in that is, you know, what would have happened if I didn't stand my ground? What would have happened if I let them do that to me? I would have been a donkey there, you know, hitting my head against the brick wall in the apprentice school with the 15 and 16 year old kids on a deliberate go slow just to conform to the system. And I would have learned nothing. It would have been a complete waste of time. It would have been wrong for the company. It would have been wrong for those people to put me through that. It would have been wrong for me looking after my own interests as well. Can I also say that it, uh, it's also a good example of keeping your eye on the prize. And the situation that you were in isn't only specific to being employed in one particular place or the other where it may or may not be well managed. This can also happen uh, in a different way to a, a business owner. So where they can get lost in the detail, they can get lost in where customers are asking and staff are throwing things at them left, right and center and requests and complicating their life. And they can get lost in that rut. Uh, and, I mean, we, it's happened to us as well. And every now and then you have to slap yourself around mm -hmm. and say, where is the goal? Where is my, my objective? Am I still going in that direction or am I scraping paint? off the side of a torpedo tube. So that's, you know, mm. there's many applications to that. And that has to be a continual case of the reality check. That's right. I mean, I look back, I look back on those years. Now, noting that was 83, I was just getting into this whole DJ entertainment business at the same time. Yeah. That was doing my head in. So here I was developing, setting up this side hustle, going to university. I was going to university part time and I had a full time job. So I'm, I'm still working my hundred hour weeks, if you will. I think the big thing here is where does that grit come from? And relating that back to the point that I made before about deciding to wear that hat and to have that modus operandi in the workplace. So when I worked with all those guys over that 12 months, I worked really, really hard. And I got all these other rewards down the track, which became apparent, and I won't bore you with all that, you know, a year or two later as well. But during all of this, the year later in 84, the entertainment business took off. I closed down the coaching college pretty much. Um, I then got into, and there's this thing called the seven to two grind. Seven uh, to two, as in? Seven to two, 7 p.m. to 2 a.m., right? right? It's, it's a thing. And it's where you can condition yourself by 
consistently applying yourself. Mm -hmm. Now, just think about it. Seven till two, that is a total of nine hours. Uh, no, five, seven hours. So seven hours times five days a week, that's 35 hours a week. That's essentially a second job, which you can apply yourself within that broad time spectrum to a side hustle. Mm -hmm. So and was, in 7 p.m. to 2 a.m., yeah. you're, you're continuing to work on that side yeah, hustle. Yeah, and then there's right. the weekend. So it is entirely possible to, to work on your side hustle and, and, and clock up 40 hours a week, yeah. which you can invest into something. And people don't look at it like this because they're so conditioned. I think, I think people nowadays on average spend something like TV is still number one and social media is number two. Yeah. I think it's like... Seven years of a person's life is spent watching TV on average and about six years on average for social media. Gosh, that's a waste. Something like this. Yeah. So back then I didn't even have a TV. And this was all pre-internet. Uh, and I didn't go out and socialize very much, if at all. I just kept a very, you know, small, close-knit um, number of friends. Yeah. And, you know, I consistently worked on this, this side hustle business. Now, in the meantime, I was still torn between being an engineer, having to complete and fulfill my three years full-time of work experience, and not wanting to fail university. And ironically, I actually put my, you know, put my head down and started to get better and better marks and work harder and harder at university as time marched forward. Mm. But it was so difficult to want to um, get the business. I had, I had full-time staff working for me in the business. I was too scared to throw my job in. And by the way, if you throw the job in too early before you're able to get it up from a cash flow perspective, you've got a 30% less chance of surviving in business. This is a well-known average fact. So you're saying if you're going to start a business, do it while you've got a stable running income stream, which yeah. may be your day job or something that exists already. Um, I totally agree with that because that puts an enormous amount of pressure on that new business to carry you Correct. As, as well. Yes. Correct. So where does the money come from? This is part of the thing that where people make mistakes. They, they, they underestimate the amount of money it costs to grow a business. True. It's one of the key reasons why people go broke. 87% of every business in Australia, especially, has a cash flow problem. Mm. So ongoing. if it's investment and it's cash flow, because quite often you might be making um, a profit, you know, a transaction might look like it's making a profit. But in fact, cash flow wise, it's going to take you backwards a long way before it starts taking you forward. So cash flow is a big topic. We're going to talk about that in another episode. But I totally understand where you're coming from. You've really got to build it up slowly or at least in a calculated fashion in That's order right. for this to, to work out. And so even though I had the full time job and I got the money coming in from the business now, mm. I was always um, bootstrapping. Now, bootstrapping is something we'll talk about in great detail over probably several episodes. Mm. It's one of my favorite talking topics, but I was bootstrapping to the point where I wouldn't allow myself to pull any more than $100 a week out of all of my income. So I'm making all this money in the business, I'm making X dollars being an engineer cadet. So obviously not you know the big money, but I'm still making decent money. Mm. Putting that into the business, financing the growth of the business, building more and more assets and equipment as I'm building up the, uh, the systems and the processes and so forth. So very quickly, I realized that because the business was doubling in size uh, from the beginning and it was scaling, I had a problem financing it and being in more than one, more one place at the same time. Sure. So very quickly, you know, I started to, to realize that I needed to create systems. I had to create, uh, well, it's like, called an OCM, an operating compliance manual. I, I took subjects at university Everything that I could take that was to do with business that I was allowed to take, um, which was within the management stream, which is what I majored in. I took contracts. I took um, we don't so it's the legal side. I took publicity practice, so that was to do with marketing and advertising to some extent as well. Uh, I took um, financial uh, finance rather in the uh, the business stream. Um, all these sort of subjects management, economics, as many as I could, which incidentally allowed me to, do, to graduate with basically a double degree as a production engineer and a mechanical engineer. And I got that in writing on a, on a, on a letterhead. And so, you know, during that period, um, I was learning all these leadership skills at work, 
and developing my own style and strategies and so forth from university and in my own business. And so I created something which gave us immediately a unique value proposition mm -hmm. and, a, and a point of difference from all of our competitors, which was the first school of its kind, which still goes today, mm -hmm. called the Australian DJ School, which was DJ and MCs. Mm -hmm. 